If you ask the 19 year old me when I was in that, in that you know, a job festival saying, hey, by the way, in 26 years from now, you're gonna have your own studio and you'll be working with Zack Snyder and Ben Affleck and all these other people, I would just be like, you're crazy. But like, here I am, you know, this Filipino kid who just taught myself how to draw and now I own an animation studio. <laughs> I also realized, wait, I think I'm the only Filipino who owns a studio in, and let alone Hollywood, right? I mean, my career led me to this moment, to this show, to, to this particular thing, to, to start my own studio and to work on this title. So that when I was given this particular source material, I can jump into it and try to like, you know, do the best that I can that, you know, that I've been preparing myself all my life for. Jay Oliva, I am so honored to have you uh, grace us with your presence here on So Janelle. I have been hearing about you and I've read your story. It's so inspiring. Thank you for making time. Thanks for having me here. I mean, when I, when I heard from you wanting to interview me, I, saw, I thought, sure, why not? I don't know what I'm gonna talk about, but sure, this is, sounds like it'll be a fun time. Let's talk about your Filipino story. And I say this a lot and I've said this to so many other people. Like I say, you know, everyone wants to go mainstream, everyone wants to cover mainstream, and we do that, and we rejoice when there's a Filipino that's crossed over, whether, you know, in whatever industry. Yeah. But I, I, I refuse to cover mainstream, I want to cover these Filipinos. I want to know your story. First of all, congratulations on Trese. Thank you, thank you. For those who have not heard of Trese, if they are Filipino, they must be living under a rock, because everyone's talking about Trese. What is it? So Trese is a comic book that was, I believe, originally published in 2005 or 2006 in the Philippines by Bajet Tan and uh, Kadir Baldissimo. And it originally started as just them photocopying um, the, the pages. And it started off with Kajo, Kajo and Budget. They were friends and, and Kajo uh, messaged Budget and said, hey, um, why don't we do a comic book? Because they had tried doing comics, but in the, comic books in the past and, and Budget was like, well, I, I don't know. And Kajo was like, hey, listen, you write 20 pages. I'll do 20 pages, I'll do, I'll draw 20 pages. And so that was their kind of like to keep them kind of going. And, you know, fast forward, they, I think they, they, were, they were telling me that they sold that first um, comic book for 30 pesos. And, uh, and it was just Xerox copies, they gave it to their friends, they have some copies, and that's what started it all. And then, you know, fa you know fast forward a couple of years, they were able to get it published you know, as, a, as a graphic novel. And then um, I believe that was when Tanya Yusin, who from Base Entertainment approached them and said, hey, you know, let's look at this and, and try to make this into a series or a movie. And then uh, she was shopping that around for about 10 years. Wow. And then uh, in 2018, that's when Netflix, uh, John Darren at Netflix Anime, saw it and thought, you know what, um, the Philippines is a growing market, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's try to do this. And that's when they gave me a call. And it was funny because I was, I was co-executive producer on, um, at, at DreamWorks, developing um, a, a project over there. And they called me and they said, hey, we have this project. It's, uh, it's from the Philippines. Uh, it's based on a Filipino comic book. And the first thing I thought of was, am I getting this because I'm Filipino? Because Were you? Did you ask? <laughs> no, I was thinking it, but I, was, I just thought, that sounds cool, right? Um, and, uh, and so, because I never get a job because I'm Filipino. I mean, there's a lot of Filipinos in Hollywood, in, in animation. There's actually a lot of us, you know. Um, but anyways, they gave me a call. They said, would you like to show run this? And I was like, of course, send it to me. They sent me the materials. I looked at it and, you know, this was in May of 2018. And then um, by, 2000, by November of 2018, they, they, did, uh, they did the announcement. I, I flew to Manila in December of 2018. I did the story summit with Tanya Yusin and the writers. They took me all over uh, the, the Manila, which I never really got to see because, you know, I don't know about you, but when I go to Manila, I'm only just eating and just visiting with relatives, right? So I never really do the touristy stuff and I never really get to see the city. So they took me to all the locations that are in the comic book, like Balete Drive, all the haunted places, told me all the backstories. We walked through Chiapo. So um, that was really kind of where I was able to kind of like, you know, get into uh, Trese because I never really had read it prior to uh, being contacted by Netflix because it wasn't published in the United States. It was only just in the Philippines. First of all, I remember budget. I remember hosting hosting a clubhouse room and he was on there. Oh, wow, that's great, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah. right? Um, but then what's striking to me was that you said that yourself. Are they, am I getting this call because I'm Filipino? Did you ever ask, did you ever find out? Here's the thing, I think I got it because again, yes, I am Filipino, 
but I think it's also because like I understand the culture so at least like you know it'd be different if there was like you know somebody uh, other ethnicity being you know who's who's heading up Tresse people would be like well why did you get this person mm -hmm. so I can understand you know where that came from but I also then I thought to myself well you know I I have a very long career. I've worked on a lot of big projects. I've adapted a lot of, um, you know, um, graphic novels and comic books to to the small screen and the big screen. So I thought, okay. I mean, I don't feel so bad that I got the job because of this. And honestly, like, if that's the reason that that got my foot in the door, then, you know, I'm gonna take advantage of it because I've never had this opportunity before in the past. You know, so I just thought, well, you know, and plus, it didn't occur to me until um, a few months after we started production that this was going to be um, something that's going to be to Filipino audiences worldwide, right? And, and this was a first thing, right? A first animated that's going to be on a big service like Netflix and that I, I need to really do well on this or else the Philippines are just, I won't be able to show my face in the Philippines. <laughs> that, that's my next question. How much pressure was that knowing? And here you are and you have a long list of credentials. Yeah. You did say that there's a lot of you, and I know there's a lot of Filipino animators, there's a lot of you guys out there, but you were picked, handpicked by um, Netflix Anime yeah. to show run this. Yeah. I mean, aside, after you got over in the initial, like, you know, questioning, like, yeah. am I getting this because I'm Filipino? What was the pressure? I think it didn't really get to me until I started doing the press junkets. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, once I get into work, it's, it's just work. It's just me and, and, you know, a small crew. I hired all, my, all of the best people in animation that I've worked with, all my friends. And for the most part, the year and some change of the production, it was just me hanging out and just, you know, creating and, and, and collaborating with these, you know, really talented people. Um, it wasn't until I started doing these press junkets within the last week or two that I realized, oh my goodness, like this is huge, right? This is something that, you know, all eyes are, you know, are on this, not only in the Philippines, but the Filipinos all around the world. I mean, I, I've had, you know, I have cousins in, in Germany and they're like, we can't wait to hear, to watch this in German, right? And, and, and it's interesting that like, it's just become this phenomenon that I, like I said, I didn't, it didn't really occur to me until I started like really thinking about it. And then, then that's when the pressure, you know, started, started to right. get to but you're done with the job, yes. right? Yeah, There's we, nothing yeah, you can do, finished, right? Yeah, we finished production in um, January of this year of 2021. So we were doing post all through the pandemic, um, but it was good. I mean, animation is easy. We could just do it from home, so it wasn't as hard. Uh, but the hard thing was trying to do the actors uh, because the actors normally we bring them into a studio um, and they do the the voice acting there. But because of the pandemic, what we had to do is re record them remotely, uh, or in some cases, um, you know, depending on SAG protocols, they had to go to a studio and like not not be in contact with anybody. Like, yeah. Exactly. But I'm going to get to that in, sure. in a bit because I'm also excited about the fact that a lot of almost all the cast members yeah. are Filipinos oh, yeah. and there are some Tagalog yeah. speakers you, you got from the Philippines as yeah. well. And I'm excited about that. But um, speaking of pressure, this is your first production out of Lex and Otis, yeah. which is your that's my, own yeah, company. That's my own animation studio. Yeah. What about the pressure from that? So that was another interesting thing um, that actually I I realized it early on. So when I started my own studio, you know, I've worked at Warner Brothers, Disney, and all the big studios. So when I started my own studio, um, it wasn't until a couple of months into the production when I was, you know, we were union. You know, I made sure that, you know, you know, everybody had a good, good, uh, you know, rate and schedule. I, I'm in charge of everything, and and I realized that um, I was in a position to change the industry from the inside. Right, because you know the, the big studios are never going to change. The union, for the most part, they they're still kind of stuck in their ways, and it's really hard to change what the union, um, you know, how they treat the artists or how the uh, you know the the rates of the artists and all these different things. So I thought, well, it's my studio. As long as I you know follow the union guidelines, I can make a studio that I want to work at. Right, and over the years, every year I kept working at a studio, thinking. Oh, maybe next year it's gonna the produ the production is gonna be better. I'm gonna get paid better, or the schedule is gonna be better. And every year it just gets tighter and tighter, right? And and there was never any kind of like, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of security, right? And so when I started doing this and realized, well, you know what? I can make a studio that is 100% artist friendly. That I wanted. I want basically. I, I told people. Listen, why don't you come over here? I'll do my best to make sure that we have as, as much work as we can and that you'll never have to look for a job again, which is what, you know, for artists, 
that's all we want to yes. work on, right? Like we, we never want to worry about like, what, you know, what job am I going to work on next? They just want to make sure they get paid well and they get treated well, mm -hmm. right? That's all we really want and work on a cool project. And so that was when I realized the pressure. And also once I, you know, once, once everything started going, so I started with one show, which was Tresse. And then eventually I ended up getting more shows, getting, you know, greenlit and, 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 and produced. And that's when I realized that, oh my God, I, I, I own a studio. It's not just one production. Like, because Tresse could have just been a one and done thing. And I own a studio. And then I also realized, wait, I think I'm the only Filipino who owns a studio in, and let alone Hollywood, right? I mean, and that's when I realized, oh wow, that's uh, some that's big shoes to fill. Yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. Exactly, right? exactly. So is it, so is it more? Is there more pressure now, or is there less because you've done one? And yeah. now you're working on this, you're getting the hang of it. And, you know, happy employees, you know, they, 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 they're more productive. Yes. In the beginning, just getting it started was kind of hard just because I didn't really know as much. Now, I mean, we, I'm sure running like five shows now. So it's kind of like, I know it. I mean, we went from like, uh, what, eight employees to, I think we're over almost 100 at this point. You know, so there's a lot of employees that I, I've never even met because right. of the, we hired them during, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I meet, I see them all on Zoom, right? And that, that's about <laughs> yeah. it. But, uh, but yeah, the, the pressure is, um, when I think about it, then I, then, I, then I get a little bit like, you know, oh my God, what's going on? But then I just focus on the work and then, you know, I just do it. Also knowing that all these people depend on you, yeah. depend on your decisions yeah. for their livelihood, yeah. right? Um, and so... I was going to say, how difficult is it to be a creative and to be making the business decisions? Because normally they don't go well. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I think the one thing that I learned, I mean, as a director in animation, like I have to kind of um, manage a team, right? I have artists underneath me. I work with production. Um, so in that space, I kind of learned, I guess, managerial skills, right? I never, I never learned that kind of stuff in school. And, and so now it's just, I look at it as just, uh, just a big kind of way where I, I just kind of like, I, I manage the team, but I have team leads who I was like, okay, you, you handle this part of the production and you handle this. And I'm, I'm, I'm good at like kind of delegating. Delegating. Right? But what kind of a boss are you? I like to be the boss that like, is kind of like, um, everybody likes, but at the same time, like, I expect you to do your job, right. you know, because right. I usually, I mean, here's the thing is that like, you know, I've had bosses before who like lose their temper and go crazy or, and I'm like, we're just making cartoons. Right? We're making animation. Right? It's, <laughs> it's not, supposed to be fun. No one's going to yeah. die, right? Yeah. Nobody's die if we, if we miss this. So for the most part, like, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit more kind of laid back, you know, but the, the one things that I do tend to be kind of strict on is just, you know, know your job. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if, if there's a particular task that's assigned to you, just, just do it and do it well. If you can't do it, just ask for help early enough, right? The worst thing, you know, that can happen is if they don't do it and then I have to end up doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And I have to remind them like, okay, if I'm doing it, then that takes me away from the more important stuff, which is running the studio, trying to get more work, trying to do all these things. And that's what I hired you for. That's what I say to my staff. <laughs> if you're having me do this, then I can't get advertisers and sponsors. Exactly. And then we're all not going to get paid, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome because you're not just giving livelihood to your staff. You're also one of those who have broken out um, to Hollywood mainstream and are extending your arm to bring people in. Yes. Which brings me to the uh, cast mm -hmm. of Trece. How involved were you in the choosing of like all the, I see familiar names, yeah. John John Briones, yeah, yeah. Shay Mitchell, yeah. you know, how involved were you? Um, I was pretty, I was very involved. I mean, ultimately we had to send our list to Netflix. So in the, in, in the beginning, my casting director, Wes Gleason, who I've worked with over at Warner Brothers for all of my DC animated stuff, I called him and I said, hey, I know nothing about casting. You're the best voice director I've worked with over the years. Can you help me at the studio? I remember he was probably the second, no, no, third person I hired on the team. The first one was Mikey Mecasero, who was my line producer. I reached out to Lee Rudnicki for my legal. He was my you know, attorney, uh, uh, entertainment attorney. And then Wes was my third person I called. And I remember I met him uh, in, in, uh, at a restaurant and I said, okay, so I have a studio. We have the show. I don't know how to get in touch with the actors, right. uh, you know, and he said, 
you know what, I can handle this. I've done this before. So he came aboard um, and I told him, so we, you know, we, I gave him the scripts, we, we, he broke it down, and then he, he got auditions out. So we, we got people, we, we sent out auditions, Audition. but I had told him that, you know, I had reached out to one of the actors prior, so I reached out to Manny Jacinto nice. from The Good Place, right? Yeah. So it was funny because I flew to Manila uh, for the Story Summit, mm -hmm. and while I was on the, on the plane, uh, I, I, I don't remember how I saw, it must have been, I saw one of his interviews, right, and he was mentioning how he was Filipino-Canadian, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I heard him in his regular speaking voice, and I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool, maybe, I, I, he should totally be honest, so I, I just cold, I would him, I messaged him on, on Twitter, oh. and I introduced myself, hey, I'm this, I'm, right. you know, I'm an executive producer, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm doing this show about, you know, the Philippines, um, would you be interested? And he actually answered, right? <laughs> <laughs> And, he had, and then I was like, right. and I said, hey, you know, uh, you know, who's your agent? You know, that way when we go into casting, I'd love to get in touch with them. And and so what happened was when when Wes Gleason, my casting director and voice director, started reaching out, I said, hey, you know, here's the info for Manny. Reach out to him and let's let's get, have. So a you handpicked him. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else you handpicked? Um, well, Manny. well, I mean, a lot of the other ones, you know, it was. It was when we got the the uh, auditions back that I listened to it, and they would be like, "Oh, by the way, do you know that that's so and so?" And I'm like, "What? That's New Diamond Phillips?" What? You right. Know? So, so it was it was funny because in the beginning we there's so many Filipinos who who applied, you mm -hmm. know, and we started filling up the main major slots, mm -hmm. and it got to the point where, you know, uh, we had filled in all the slots, but there were still a few left over that I was like, "Okay, we who are we who can we get for this?" Right. And those were when we ended up reaching out to other voice actors who we just sent, um, who weren't Filipino, didn't have a Filipino background, but they had friends who were Filipino, or, right. or they could actually do the accent, because we sent them the accent uh, right. as, as a kind of way, hey, can you do a version of this? Oh, so, that's yeah, awesome. That's how we did it. What's, what's striking to me is when you heard some of them, some yeah. of the auditions, you didn't know that they were Filipino. Yeah, yeah. no. That's yeah, so we just listen. It's all just listening. A lot of times when when I listen to the auditions, I don't even know who it is. Right. And then I pick the best one, and then it's like, oh, by the way, you just pick so and so. In in, in the case of like, for example, uh, I don't know if you know Eric Bauza. So yeah. Eric Bauza is a. Uh, he used to be. An, he started as an artist in animation, and then he kind of. Uh, he pivoted and, and went to voice oh, acting, uh -huh. but he's the voice of Bugs Bunny, all the Looney Tunes. Oh. Like, he's huge. Like he does everything. Okay. And he's Filipino, I didn't know right? him. He, yeah. Oh my yeah. god. And, and, uh, and so anyways, when uh, when I was picking all the ones that I liked, mm. he was almost every single part. <laughs> oh. Right. So I had so so Wes was like, "Okay, Jay, you we can't have Eric do every, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Every voice. Yeah, we can't do every voice." So I was like, "Okay, but I was like, he's so good. Like right. he did like his range is so, you know, he, he yeah. has a big range." Um, but but yeah, it was one of those things where as we as we got our our supporting cast and we tried to find certain ones. So John John was one of the ones that was recommended. And I was like, would he even do it? You know, right. and and so we reached out, and you know, he was he was like, of course. Oh, that's and and awesome. yeah, and it was one of those things where like so many Filipino actors like just came out of the woodwork and said, of course we will do this. You know, because again, how often do you get do they get a chance like this, right? So exactly, yeah. exactly. Liza Sobrang. Oh yeah, Liza is big. Oh my God, How'd you yes, get her? yeah, <laughs> yeah. When when her name came up, so when we started talking about the Tagalog cast, because mm -hmm. originally. I was going to cast uh, actors from the Philippines, mm -hmm. right? But how do I record them? Do I fly them out here? Mm -hmm. Do I go out do there? You, yeah. you know, and I, the logistics was just, it was just too hard. And mm -hmm. at the time I needed to record them here in LA. Mm -hmm. So um, so we just foregone that and we just decided, well, when we do the Tagalog cast, because I always knew that there was going to be a Tagalog um, uh, track, uh, we'll just go from there. We'll get local talent for that. So when we started making our list for that, um, the main thing was like, okay, we need somebody who, who's really good for the, the, the lead of Alexandra. And so we had thrown around some names, and, and of course, you know, Tanya was like, well, you know, Liza Soberan is really good. And I'm like, will she do it, <laughs> right? I mean, that's like huge, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then it was one of those things where Tanya was like, well, we could ask. And that, that's what, and it eventually... So she was also handpicked yes. by Tanya. Yeah, well, and also uh, it was one of those things where when he, so we submit our list to Netflix, and then Netflix, of course, weighs in. Right. So Shay was one of the ones that Netflix had weighed in and said, hey, you know, we have a great relationship with Shay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, She's Filipino. Yeah, and we'd like her, we'd like her to, for the role. And, and that's, I, that's when I mentioned, would she do it? You know, yeah. because originally I had asked, 
do you want me to stunt cast this, mm. right? And they said, no, whoever you want. And I'm like, really? And then they're like, whoever you want. And I'm like, okay. And then of course they came back and said, by the way, Except for how about <laughs> Shay? And I'm like, and, but I was like, do you have contact to Shay? Because I've never worked with her before. Do you? And they're like, yeah, let's, we'll, we'll get you in contact. And of course, you know, she, she, she jumped on and it was, it was great. It was really good. You, it sounds like a dream project. It so was. It was. Like it was everything. Was easy. Everything yeah. was easy, yeah. right? Well, I mean, it was. It, it was difficult, you know, trying to, you know, get this moving. But but all along the way, like everybody just brought their A game, right? I mean, we had actors coming. You know, they're bending over backwards. We had one actress who came, uh, who drove down from San Francisco just to do the do just to do the voice, right? Um, and and. And we started gaining momentum, right? And to the point where, for example, Darren Chris. Mm -hmm. So we had a role that was it was a small role for this season, but it's going to be a big role later on. And we were trying to figure out, like, well, who could we get for that? And then my uh, one of my directors, uh, David Hartman, he had worked with Darren Chris on Transformers, on Transformers Prime, because da Dave was the showrunner on that show. Uh -huh. And he's like, well, Darren Chris is Filipino, and I'm like, yeah, but it's Darren Chris, you know. Right, right. Uh, and, and Dave was like, well, you know, da Darren's usually pretty busy, but why don't we reach out to him? So I asked Wes Gleason. I'm like, let's let's give it a shot, mm -hmm. and uh, it worked out. You know, I, Darren is like, you know, hey, I'm very busy, but I can I can do this record in here. Time, yeah. And when he showed up, it was funny. He showed up for one day uh, for for the record of I think he was in two or three episodes. Uh, we just recorded them all at once. But he said, he had mentioned how he's like, yeah, you know, um, if my mom found out that all the other Filipinos in Hollywood were in this thing and I, and, right. and I passed, he's like, I'd never hear the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, he's like, so I had to be in this, right? Because right. at that point, you know, John John had been on it, all of the other actors, like, you know. Uh, and so he was like, I, you know, I'm going to be, I have to, I'm going to be guilted into this. So he's like, I have to be in this. <laughs> I love that. So the first season is six. Oh, six, six episodes. How, how long is the episode? Uh, One hour? They range, no, I wish it was an hour. Um, they, they range to a, from anywhere from 20 two to maybe 25 minutes okay yeah. and then how many seasons will there be just one they just did one oh. yeah that's yes okay so but wait is there a, a, a is there a possibility that it oh of course of course i mean so you know on. yeah it, it depends i think the biggest thing is it just depends on the audience in the philippines whether or not they they'll show up and actually watch it i mean i was I was uh, I was afraid that it might be international audiences, which I think will still show up. I think yeah, Filipinos around the world exactly, will watch it, right? For but sure. I think because uh, the Philippines and Manila is such a very like strong market right now, and, and it's a growing market, right? I think they haven't reached saturation in terms of their subscribers in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So they think that uh, I think they they they, they thought. If they target this market and create content for this market, maybe that like, this market can grow for them, and that's why if this does well there, then that's why we're seasons, yeah. that's why we're talking to our Philippine audience as well. We hope everyone comes out yeah. and subscribes to Netflix in order to watch this, right? Yeah. So, and I was watching the trailer. There's Tiana, yeah, there's Tiana. and all the, and all the other like uh, what do you call the Tikbalang, Tikbalang, and all that. It, it brought me back to my childhood because I was born and raised in the Philippines, oh, okay. right? Um, but anyway, here you are, a business owner, an accomplished artist, an executive producer, and now you even have the ear for your talent, yeah. right? Um, but we, you almost didn't go this route. Now we're going to the Jay Oliva story. Um, and, I'm, and like I said, I'm so honored. This is the first time that you're sharing your story yeah. with us. Um, so you almost became a doctor. Yes. Can you tell us almost. about it? Tell us about your journey. Like most Asian families, right? My parents are like, don't go into art. There's no money in art. Be a doctor, right? And so, um, I mean, I, I always had a kind of aptitude for art growing up. You know, I mean, I think my dad's an architect, so I think that's where I got my artistic talent from. And my dad used to draw things for me when I was a kid. Um, but, but I have an older brother uh, who's 10 years older than me and a sister who's eight years older than me. So I'm the accident. So growing up, I never really had anybody to play with. So what I would do is I would just draw, right? A lot of times, because my brother and sister were either in high school or they were a lot older out with their friends, I was stuck at home right. and all I had was just TV, a piece of paper and crayons or whatever. So I would just draw, I'd watch cartoons and I would draw. And I'm one of those self-taught artists, so I never had art school. Uh -huh. but, yeah, never, no, no training. So what I did was I would just, I would uh, trace things in a book and then I would teach myself how to draw. And that's how I taught myself how to draw. You know, I, I did, I traced comic books. So I would, I would, I remember I would record on my Betamax cartoons and I would put a paper on top of the, and I would trace it. So, so art could be learned. Oh yes, oh yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that um, 
artistic skill or actually the technical side of drawing, it's it's like uh, it's just a it's, you just practice, it's just muscle man, memory. Now the talent comes with how you use it, right? So it's it's because some people say like, oh, I'm not an artist. I'm like, well, I can teach you how to draw, but the talent, whether how talented you are as an artist, it just it's up to you. Right? Right, kind of like your imagination working and all that. Yeah, it's like think about it. It's like it's like a uh, basketball, right? Uh -huh. Remember the first time you tried to dribble a basketball, you're like double dribbling, and you're right. like, this is so unfamiliar, right? right. But if you put the time and effort, right, like those NBA players, right, they're not even looking and they're, and they're bouncing. They go between the legs and they're not even looking. Right. And that's really what, you, what art really is, is that you, if you don't give up, right, because here's the thing, I think everybody uh, is born an artist, right? Mm -hmm. It's just as you get older, people tell you you're not an artist, right? They like, you know, when you're a little kid and you draw a unicorn or a, uh, or a horse, right, Somebody says, well, that doesn't look like a horse, it looks like a pig, and then they laugh at you, right? right? And, and what happens? Most of us, like, oh, I guess you're right, I'm not an artist, and they stop drawing, mm -hmm. right? People like myself, who, I was just like, forget you, I'm gonna just draw on my own, I'm doing this for myself, right? And, and, and we persevered, and then we honed our skills, because again, it's all muscle memory, it's all, it's just like, you know, writing your name. The more you do it, e the easier it gets, right? And that's, and that's how it is, it's just, you just start and you just repetitive action over and over and over. But what happens, like I said, at some point, when the talent comes in, is how you use that and how when you're, when you're put into situations where uh, you can, the talent can come out. So for example, like I, I think I'm a pretty good storyteller, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I love telling stories, but I hate drawing. Like, I mean, the drawing allows me to get my ideas across, you know, and so I've honed my, my drawing skill to a certain point, but I know that I'm never going to be the best artist. Like, there's tons of artists out there who are faster than me and, and are technically more proficient than me, right? Mm -hmm. And that's okay, because mm -hmm. where, where my skill set comes in is the storytelling, right? I, I wanted to tell stories that make people fall in love, that they cry or they get scared. And that, to me, is what got me interested in, in, in the filmmaking process, right? Because the, the, the actual animation part, I never really wanted to be an animator, right? Because to me, that's the most boring job, just because, you know, you're, you're drawing, um, you know, it's 24 frames per second, you know, you're drawing every little kind of nuance, which it's a, it's a, it's a crazy skill to know that. And, and all the artists who can do that, I was, I'm in awe of. But that's something that's not really what I really like to do. But... In my line of work, though, I need to draw to, uh, to convey the ideas to the clients or to whoever. Um, to the audience. Yeah, to the audience. And so I have to be at a certain level. But what I try to excel at is, is like, how do I tell that story, right? How do, I, mm -hmm. how do I do it in such a way that is, is unique to myself? But it's also, it's just a reflection of, like, you know, my skills and, or the, the influences I have. Like, so, for example, like, I love John Ford, Akira Kurosawa, you know, all of the kind of classic directors, right? Um, uh, Kubrick, right? And so what I, I did is I would study those directors and try to really figure out like how they, they how they tell the story. And there's, it's really interesting how there's a language to film mm -hmm. and how you can, the best films are the ones you can turn off the sound mm -hmm. and you can already know what's happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just by looking at the shots and how it's, how it's framed and how the camera's moving just by looking at and that's when I was like wow this is so amazing there's there is this language of, of film that I never knew about but remember nobody taught me that so when I started working in animation it was it was at a time it was 1995 no 96 um, and there was no storyboard classes there was nothing like you just had to be able to draw so they hired me and uh, and so they you know they said here you know, here, if you want to learn how to storyboard, here's the five seasons of cinematography, and here's a stack of storyboards that are about this high. Just read this and study that. And that's how I learned. How did you get hired? Oh, that's a funny story. So, Because um, you were in pre-med school. Well, I was in well, undergrads, yeah. Undergrad, so I was, okay. I was in my sophomore year okay. of, of college. So I, was, I went to Loyola Marymount, right? Yes. Um, it was a private school. It was a beautiful school. Preppy. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> campus. Yeah. Uh, I went there as a, as a bio major, right? And uh, my second year as a sophomore, I was taking, um, I, I, was, I took all of the communication arts requirements. So I did all of the art of the cinema and all these cinema classes. And there was nothing left. And they were like, oh, you need another uh, communication arts requirement. So I, I, saw, I, thought, I saw there was animation. And I was like, well, I know how to draw. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'll take, I'll, take, uh, I'll take that class. I didn't want to animate. So just remember, I don't want to animate. But I thought, well, I can draw. This might be an easy A for me. Right. So I took the class. My my uh, my 
professor was Van Partible, who's the guy who created uh, Johnny Bravo. Yeah, and, and so Van, he was a young guy at the time, you know, he taught me, he taught me how to do animation. And then I remember at, at some point he, he was like, okay, this is how you do storyboards. And I remember he spent, I don't know, maybe uh, 15 minutes going over it, right? It was something that I, I didn't think I would ever going to use. Right. So fast forward, so I did my student film that, that year, that semester, right? That was in the fall. The following, uh, the following semester, I took the, the more advanced class because I got an A. I was like, oh, this is good. I got right. an A in it. This is easy yes. for you. So, yeah. so in that semester, I believe it was in February or March, um, there was a Job Opportunities Expo for animation, right? So let, let, me, let me just set this up for you. So I was going to college at, at, at Loyola Marymount, right? I was working at Computer City selling computers. Right? I, I, was doing, I was doing customer service, I was answering phones, and I was on the sales floor selling computers right? Right. for like something like $3 an hour. It was, it was nothing. But I remember this very, very um, clearly is that my cousin gives me a call, uh, and uh, my cousin Marvin, and he's like, you know, hey, Jay, there's an animation uh, expo, a job opportunities expo uh, you know, in, in uh, Universal St City. Do you want to go to this? And I'm like, uh, he's like, well, I was like, when is it? He's like, it's Sunday. I'm like, uh, okay, well, how much does it cost? He's like, $20. To no, get in. To get in. Yes. Like $20 at $3 an hour. An hour, hour. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, I'm yeah. Just like, that's almost my whole week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what happened was, uh, you know, he said, just go. I was like, okay. So I, uh, you know, we, we drove there and I, I got out of the car and we started walking up to the, the hotel. And my cousin's like, where's, where's your portfolio? And I'm like, I don't have a portfolio. And he's like, he's like, don't you have any drawings? And I'm like, yeah. I was like, I have some. Luckily, I had, I had some, in the, some car. in the car, right? right okay. now, now, I'm one of those artists where I can't draw in a sketchbook because right. it's like a mental block. I want to make every page beautiful. Right. So, so I tend to only draw the first couple pages, and then I never touch the sketchbook again. Right. But I do like to draw in loose leaf paper because at oh. least if I draw in loose leaf paper, if I don't like it, I just throw it away, right? right? right. Instead of right. ripping it out. Right. So anyways, I had a ton of like drawings loose. like that. Yeah, just yes. loose, right? Yes. It's in the back in my, my trunk. I just grabbed a handful of it, right? Uh -huh. And I, there, was this, there was a manila folder that had somebody else's name that I just scratched out, and I put that in the manila folder, and I went inside. Mm -hmm. And when I got in there, I was just blown away because it's, it was all professionals, right? All, all guys dressed in ties, and they had mm -hmm. leather portfolios. <laughs> they were all like probably double my age, right? right? right. And I'm here, this kid with this you know, terrible, like just, just basically just nothing of a portfolio. Was your cousin an artist as well? Is that why? Uh, yeah, he was an artist, but he, uh, he just more of a hobby. He does it for a hobby, but but he he knew that he saw the potential in me, and he was always trying to push me. He's right. like, hey, you should try to do this. Okay, so you went there. So I went there. Anyways, long story short, uh, we he we split up. He said, hey, go. Uh, I'm gonna go check out this side. You go that side. I'm looking around, and there's all these tables. All the directors are there. Recruiters are there. They're all looking at portfolios, and I'm just looking, right? And I'm not gonna show them anything. My cousin comes running up. He's like, Jay. Marvel Films is over in the corner there, you know, why don't you show them your stuff, right? So I go over there, um, they're, they're, the new show there was The Incredible Hulk, it was on Fox, you know, Fox Kids at the time. But all of the artists were crowding around there, mm -hmm. so the, the line was long. But there was this one table to the side for Spider-Man in the 90s, right, in Fox Kids, and there was only one person in line. Okay. So I was like, okay, cool. So I went there, I was looking over his shoulder, and uh, there was an artist there, and he had the most beautiful like uh, comic book pages. Like the pencils were so tight, they were beautiful, right? right. And uh, and what happened was that uh, you know the the guy behind the counter is looking. He's like, oh, this was good, this is good. And he looked at the guy and he said, do you have any storyboard samples? And the guy's like, storyboard. He's like, no, I I just draw comics. Right. right? And so so the guy behind the counter gave him his card. He was like, well, here's my card, you know. Uh, you know, get a storybook yeah, yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have a storybook, someone give me a yeah. call, right? So, anyways, uh, the guy leaves. I go up, and and I remember the like 15 minutes or 30 minutes that my professor had talked about storyboarding, right. and I'm like storyboards. I know storyboards, and I like give him my portfolio, and I'm just rambling. Now, remember, I've never done a job interview, right. so I'm just trying to say anything right. to kind of like get right. be the keyword, yeah. right? And so he, he looks at my portfolio and he's like, yeah, 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 he's looking, 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 and I'm just trying to like talk. And um, he gets to the, and again, this is what changed my, my life. This is the sliding doors moment, right? So luckily I had put in the storyboards from my student film from the previous semester, okay. right? And I remember I had done it on and one piece of paper, animation bond paper, and I had about, uh, I don't know, maybe like 20 shots in there, right? Mm -hmm. All thumbnails. Mm -hmm. So he pulls it out, 
and so he's remember all of my all of my drawings were all they're all just like oh here's Spider-Man here's Wolverine here's <laughs> Superman right I mean it was just it was nothing that, you yeah. know it was nothing that was right. anything animation right, related right. right and but he got to that until that one and he looked at that uh -huh. and and then he did this he, he started looking at the shots uh -huh. right and then the guy next to him, he nudges him, he's like, hey, take a look at this. And then he looked at me and he's like, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm 19, but I'll be 20 in a few months if that makes a difference, right? <laughs> and so uh, he, reached underneath his, he's, he reached underneath his desk, he, he, he pulled out uh, paper, all this paper, it was all the models from the show, storyboard paper, and then he, he took out a script and he circled a page in the script and he says, um, you know, do this page and let me see it in a week. And, and so... Um, I had a test. That's, that's an animation test. I was ecstatic. I was like cloud nine, right? Nice. And so I, uh, you know, I, I went home. I started working on it, and uh, and then Monday came around. I worked on it. Tuesday, and then Wednesday. Um, this is this is where the story turns. Um, I talked myself out of it. I, 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 I it, it dawned on me that like, no, what you am be I a doing? Doctor. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I, I was, I, I, and I, I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm too young. Maybe in a couple of years, I'll, I'll call him and contact okay. him. You know, let me finish college. I just talked myself out of it. Okay. Right? So I stopped doing it. And then so Thursday came around, and my, my college roommate, Mike, Mike Sullivan, um, who I'd known since high school, our, our schedules were always different, right? Mm -hmm. So Thursday night is the only time we ever get to kind of hang out and eat and see each other. So Thursday night, he's like, hey, Jay, how's the test coming along? And, I, and then, of course, I tell him, oh, you know, I'm flattered, I'm too young, maybe when I finish school, I give him all the excuses that, that like, I, I, I basically talked myself out of. And, and this is, again, I, I, every year I say thank you to this guy. So um, Mike looked at me, he's like, listen, like, um, if, you, if you do it and they don't like it, at least you know. But if you do it and they, and, and they do like it, this could change your life. And it was the it was the pep talk I needed I needed to hear right it was it was the one thing that like because remember at that time I was 19 yeah. I was so unsure of myself right. like I I didn't know whether I thought they would look at this and just laugh their asses right. off and then I'd just be rejected and just feel even worse mm -hmm. right um, and that I needed that talk so I I, I stayed up all night that night and working then I on working on it and then I turned it in the next day I drove over I turned it in but when I got there the the guy who was there I was supposed to turn in had had gone home for the day and I was like oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh no, okay. Yes. So, uh, so anyways, uh, so I turned it in and I thought it was over. So then the following week, Monday came around, no call. Tuesday came around and then I remember that was when it was spring break, so I was doing overtime, I was doing stocking and whatnot. At the computer store. At the computer store, okay. right? And then on Wednesday, uh, I got a call. It was Bill Riling, that was his name. So Bill Riling, he was the supervising uh, director over at, at Marvel, and he calls me. He's like, oh, Jay, you know, hey, I'm sorry I didn't call you soon enough. I've just been really busy. Um, but, you know, I, I got your test. I really like it. You know, uh, how would you like to come in as a revisionist? Uh, you know, which is the very bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, are you kidding me, right? Yeah. And, and so uh, I said, they said, well, how soon can you start? And I was like, I can start right now. They're like, no, no. I was like, why don't you start on Monday? So I started on Monday, and that was, uh, that was the beginning of my career. Like, I started as a revisionist, which is basically, you're not even a storyboard artist. You're just doing fixes. It's bottom level. Bottom, bottom level. And took you out of school? Well, yeah. So what happens at this, remember, this was in March. So what I did is I, I split my time. So I finished up the semester, mm -hmm. right? So I, I had classes from 8 a.m. till about noon. Mm -hmm. And then I would then drive to uh, the studio and work from like 1 till about midnight. Right, and no then I, and I just did that yeah, every day, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but that was when that was when I started, you know, when I was working there, and I, I and I saw I was doing a lot of fixes on on storyboards that had a lot of problems, right? They would basically say, "Oh, fix this, redraw this," but there was one particular storyboard where this artist, for some reason, like I had to do a lot of fixes on their stuff, and so mm -hmm. finally I had to ask my boss. I asked Bill, "Why do you keep hiring this guy?" And he's like, "Well, there's not a lot of people that know how to do this, right?" And he's like, "It's it's easier for me to just hand it out and fix it than to not start it from scratch." Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so I asked him, like, "Well, you know, um, is it that hard to find storyboard artists?" He's like, "Yeah." He's like, "Not many people know how to do this." And I was like, "Okay, well." How much do they make? And he told me it was like, I think it was like three times as much as I made as a, as a revisionist. And I was like, oh, wow. And I was like, so is there a test you have to take? Is there like an MCAT, LSAT? Is there something? Right. And, and he's like, no, no, no. He's like, all you have to do is just know how, and you just know how to draw and, and no film. I'm like, oh, interesting. Mm. And, so, um, he's the, uh, and so I, 
I asked, him, well, can I learn this? And so that's when he gave me the five seasons of cinematography. He gave me a stack of storyboards, and he said, read this and study this. And it was one of those things where I would, so I would stay, I would do my full eight to 10 hours of, of working, mm -hmm. but I would stay li later at the studio, and I would, I would read the book, and I would look at the storyboards, read the book, and I did that for quite a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And then at, I, remember, I remember it was late at night, it was like, it clicked. It was like riding a bike, right? Mm -hmm. Where, how do I balance? And then suddenly, you don't you never forget. And, you, and so it was one of those things where I realized that instead of there being like 100 shots, you know, for any particular situation, there's only two, two or three. And that all depends on, you know, where the, what the previous shot was set up and the shot that you're going to do afterwards. And that's when I realized that, you know, anytime Spider-Man was in trouble, it was always a down shot. Whenever the, you know, the Green Goblin was like, I have you now, Spider-Man, it was always an up shot. And that was when I realized, like, oh, there's a language to film that I never knew. And, and at that point, when I looked at storyboards or when I watched films, I was like a sponge. I just could not stop learning. So I started storyboarding uh, a couple months after that. So the, the, my director gave me a shot. So I, I first started storyboarding on, on Spider-Man. And then when that production finished, I went to Sony as a storyboard artist. So, uh, and then when I was at Sony, that's when I became a director. I, I was a director by the time I was 21. So it was about two years later. And then, and then fast forward, I own a studio. <laughs> no, what an awesome journey. So knowing what you know now, what would you have changed? Would you, would you change oh, anything? Would you have done um, anything differently? I think, uh, so I, I think one of the things that, it's not really a regret, but it's just who I am. So one of the things is when, when, when I was trying to become a director, so when I was at Sony, uh, they had promoted a lot of the storyboard artists to directors, and I was like, I didn't know if that was a thing. That's, yeah. I, and so I asked my producer, my executive producer, Audio, and I said, so how did uh, these guys get promoted? Did, did they, is, was it MCAT, is there an LSAT? Is there a, <laughs> right. Do you have to join the Directors yeah, yeah. Guild of America? Right. Like, how do you become a director? Right. And he was laughing, he's like, no, Jay, he's like, you just have to be really good. Like, he's like, He's like, if you turn in your storyboards and 95% of the storyboards don't get changed, he's like, you're probably ready for being a director. I was like, ah, oh, interesting. And then, and then that's when I asked him, like, how much did they make? And it was like twice as much as a storyboard artist. And I was like, I gotta learn how to do that. And so that's why I became a director because I was mostly trying to you know, get that job. So the point of my story was uh, when, I, when it was up to, so, so when there was an opening for a director, um, I, I was hoping that the strength of my work would just get me the promotion, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm not the kind of person that would go out and campaign, Got right? It. But be okay. because I'm also Filipino and Asian, it's that whole kind of thing that I, I don't... We don't toot our own, own exactly. horn. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, I, and I think that's what held me back in my, in my early career was because um, I didn't do that. So I saw other directors who maybe weren't as talented as me or, or, or just were better campaigners and, and talkers. Yeah. yeah, and they were getting promotions. And I, I was like, well, I felt kind of left behind because, again, that's not how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And plus, at the time, I was still... I was still kind of, um, kind of not. I mean, I was doing really good work, but it was one of those things where I didn't think like I was a superstar or anything, right? right? So I just thought like, well, my work is good. If you know, when they thought I'm ready, that's that's when I'll ask for it, right? You left it up to them yeah. too, right? Yeah. yeah. Instead okay. of me just going Go say, this is what I want, and you know, that's the American way, which mm -hmm. is, goes against everything that I grew up with, right? And I think that's what kind of held me back. That's the one thing that I kind of regret that I think I could have taken advantage of, of uh, and kind of accelerated my career at an early Even point. faster? Even faster. But you started at 19, by, by 21 oh, yeah. you were directing, my gosh, yeah. and you were held back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and, and now with that, okay, you would have changed that. Um, what about now? How do you feel we're a few days away from the the premiere, the, yeah. the actual, how do you say that? The start of the... Yes, the premiere, yeah, the premiere, yeah, the, the premiere, launch, yeah, the, the launch, launch, yeah. Like, how do you feel? Um, it's, 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 I think it's a long journey, right? I, I think I mentioned this in, I did a press junket last night and I was telling, uh, this is with the Filipino journalists in Manila, and I told them that I think my career, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years, I think my career led me to this moment, to this show, to, to this particular thing, to, to start my own studio and to work on this title. Because um, if I had gotten this opportunity earlier, I don't think I would have been ready for it, right? And I had to go through all these trials and tribulations to work on all these different shows, all these different IPs, all these different like big things, so that when I was given this particular source material, 
I can jump into it and try to like, you know, do the best that I can that, you know, that I've been preparing myself all my life for. And I think that that's kind of how I think about it. And again, it's, it's big shoes to fill, but at the same time, you know, it's one of those things where I, I really wanted to do this as a love letter to the stories that my, my parents told me, uh, you know, as a kid, right? And, and, and that, you know, for me, Manila was romanticized because I, I didn't grow up there. I, I don't, I, so it wasn't until I was much later in life that I went there that, you know, I had these rose-colored glasses of what Manila was like. So doing this show was my way of kind of showing my parents, like, you know, even though I, I wasn't raised in the Philippines, that I love my culture and I love, and, and the fact that they immigrated here to provide a life for me like this that I, I appreciate it. Because here's a funny story, my mom doesn't know, my parents don't even understand what I do. They just think I just draw. They right, just, they're like, oh, right. he, when people ask my mom, like, what does your, what does your son do? They're like, oh, you know, he's a college professor. <laughs> oh, I because teach, you I, teach, I, I yes. Said, so the school I dropped out of, right. A couple years later, they, they called me in and said, hey, can, can you, you teach here? And yeah. I've been teaching there for about 20 years now. Oh yeah, Loyola Marymount. Yeah. What an awesome journey you've had. What's in store? What, what's on the horizon? What's uh, next? The studio itself, we're doing quite a few productions. You know, I'm, I'm working. So I created the studio primarily to, to reach out to other creatives who maybe don't know how to make an animation, uh, animated series or, or movie. Um, or if they have an idea as, you know, hey, instead of pitching your idea as a live action, uh, right. why don't you make it as an animation, mm -hmm. right? And then it becomes a proof of concept at that point, because then you can do it, do it as an animated series for pennies comparatively to then a hundred million dollar film. True. Build up, build up your, you know, build up your, your fan base, right? Mm -hmm. And then pivot that into a live action deal, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and that's and that's kind of where I've, I've made the studio to be that. So we right now we're we're developing with quite a few um, other creatives. I've got like last time I checked, it was twenty plus um, development wow. projects, um, as well as you know, uh, we're constantly pitching to Netflix, Amazon, all the different streamers. Right now is a really good time because I think prior to the time of the streamers, like me doing this, uh, it would be impossible. Mm -hmm. But now someone like myself can go directly to the it's streamers. Yeah. yeah, I go to streamers and say, hey, I can make it, I can make this product and, and let's make it together as opposed to, in the old days I had to pitch it to a Disney executive mm -hmm. or a Warner Brothers executive who may not be feeling it and then they are the gatekeeper of whether or not it goes to the next level, mm -hmm. right? Whereas for here, I go right directly to, you know, to the streamers and say, hey, this is, this, these are the projects I feel passionate about. What do you think? And then they tell me yes or no. So. This is awesome. So now look, we've looked back on your journey. We've talked about Trece. We've talked about mistakes. We've talked about everything. Um, what lesson do you want people to draw from your story? I think the biggest thing is that um, I think it's hope, right? I, I hope in a sense that like, um, I hit a lot of roadblocks in my career of just, mo it, was, it was like, you know, personal stuff as career stuff, because I, 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 I never thought I was ever good enough, right? And in fact, when I was in school, you know, in a class of 20 artists, you know, in my animation class, I think I was 10, I was number 10, right? And what was funny is that like, every year I try to look up the number one guy and I don't see him on IMDb. I, I always wonder what happened to that guy because he was so good, right? And and for me though, because I wasn't the, ever top of my class, but the fact that like I I, I worked really hard and I never gave up, and I and, you know, I attribute that to you know having Filipino parents and my parent, my mom ever saying like it's never good enough, right? You all know this. I I bring home a B plus. Why didn't you get an A? Yeah. You get an A. Why didn't you get an A plus, right? Why isn't honors? Why aren't you in honors, right? So I think that kind of it's a strive for excellence that I think kind of pushed me to get to where I am. But at the same time, it was one of those things where um, I like to tell people my story because I want them to understand that like, it's not gonna be easy, but if you stick with it and work really hard, you can accomplish your dreams. I mean, look at me. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, this Filipino kid who just taught myself how to draw and now I own an animation studio. Right. Right. <laughs> and I'm doing, you know, I'm working with, you know, big projects. I'm working with top talent, you know. You know, I'm, it's, it's, when I think about my, my life, it, if you ask the 19 year old me when I was in that, in that you know, a job festival saying, hey, by the way, in 26 years from now, you're gonna have your own studio and you'll be working with Zack Snyder and Ben Affleck and all these other people. I would just be like, you're crazy. Are you kidding me? You, you're crazy. Uh, and, but like, 
here I am, you know, and, and, and here I'm getting interviewed about my story, you know, and this never happened. You should have a cartoon about your story. It's, it's going to be, it's, it's inspiring. Well, it's I mean, one of, one of the things I want to mention, I know this is running a little long, was that, um, so I, I still teach, right? Um, I teach, the reason why, it's, it's funny because, you know, um, every time they ask me, do you want to, can you teach another year? I, I'm so busy, right? Because um, my class is, is a six hour class. I teach for six hours, right? It's just once a week. Right. But, but the thing is, is that I, it doesn't pay anything. Like, teachers don't get paid anything. But the thing is, is that I do it because I think to myself, if I don't teach this class, what if the person taking the class, I can change their life? Right, and and always it, it kind of guilts me into like, oh no, I should do this because even even if there's one person's life that I've changed, right, it's it's worth it, right. And, and a lot of my students in the past have come up to me and said, hey Jay, you know, um, before I took your class, I didn't like storyboard, I hated it or whatever. And but he's like, after your class, I love it, right. And they're all directors and producers now. And and so for me, it's kind of like, you know, Bill Ryling like took a chance with me. Like I I have my test still, and it's not very good. I wouldn't hire myself, right. But he saw something in me way back when, and um, he took a chance. And, and now, as I'm in this position, I try to give back and do the same thing. All across my career, I was always trying to help people and, and try to like, you know, get them to have the same opportunities that I had. Because for me, it's like, you know, like I've been given this, I've been blessed with this great opportunity that, you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta keep kind of giving forward. So that's kind of why I, I do what I do. And that's why now I have a studio. I'm trying to do that for my artists and trying to like, again, change the industry from the, from the inside and make a studio that I want to always work at. I love that. We will end on that note. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks. This was wonderful. Yes.